As I close my eyes and take a stroll down memory lane, I find myself engulfed in a wave of nostalgia. Carried back to the days of carefree wonder when Jetpack Joyride was my cherished escape, the anticipation that would build as I launch the game on my trusty device, the excitement of donning that jetpack and soaring through vibrant, pixelated landscapes. It was a world where dreams and reality blended seamlessly, and every tap of my finger translated to boundless adventure. The thrill of dodging lasers and zappers, and the sheer delight of collecting coins that sparkled like treasure, and the occasional laughter that erupted as I met my humorous end. And how could I fail to mention the legendary Barry Steak Fries, the brave protagonist of my childhood adventures in Jetpack Joyride. A man who dodged lasers and donned a jetpack of bullets that accelerated upwards and downwards. Wait, how is Barry even alive? Now, let's put aside the nostalgic thrill of Jetpack Joyride and zoom in on Barry himself. How is he still going? The jetpack itself has two miniguns strapped near his feet, and logically, over time, this jetpack has to heat up to a scorching point, enough to crisp Barry. Now, besides the slow heat up of the jetpack, the bullets shooting out from the jetpack's bottom should be scalding his feet as well. And aside from the jetpack, he also gets ridiculously close to lasers burning hotter than the sun itself. And let's not forget the extreme speed of the jetpack, teleporters, and other power-ups. All of these should be enough to turn him quite crispy. So, why is Barry still alive when it seems like he shouldn't be? Barry is quite the character, and to prove he's truly unique, let's look at his jetpack. What do you see? Yeah, it's a jetpack with too many guns that shoots bullets. Now, these bullets create tiny little explosions every single time they fire, and these explosions keep happening non-stop just like a rapid-fire machine gun. Normally, when things like a minigun get too hot, they have to cool down before they can fire again but not Barry's jetpack. The heat from all these little explosions continues to build up since he keeps on firing indefinitely. Meaning, after a certain point, his jetpack reaches unfathomable temperatures. Like heating a metal pan on the stove, eventually the heat transfers enough to the point that it's gonna get too hot to touch. As for Barry's jetpack, it's likely made of steel, and steel melts at about 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. But amazingly, at this temperature, Barry stays cool. He doesn't get burnt or flustered by this intense heat. Now, it's clear that this jetpack would logically heat up due to the laws of physics governing our world. You can't just keep firing bullets without generating heat. That's an undeniable fact. An illustration of this reality can be seen here in this footage of an M60 machine gun from DeGroat Tactical Armaments. In the video, the machine gun fires continuously for about a minute, and within this short time span, it transitions from cool to going red hot eventually igniting into flames after roughly two minutes. So, let's figure out the time it takes and the temperature the jetpack reaches when it's firing. According to a piece by Scientific American, the blast resulting from gunpowder combustion can reach a searing 5,390 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, as time progresses, the explosive action and the jetpack's heat will eventually reach an equilibrium, assuming the jetpack doesn't catch fire prior to the equilibrium point. While we can deduce that the jetpack will ultimately hit a temperature of 5,390 degrees Fahrenheit, our focus now turns to questions like, what's the temperature after a single shot? How about after a minute of continuous firing, or after several more shots? To uncover these answers, we have to examine the energy released in these scenarios. The amount of energy released by the blast is influenced by several factors. By examining a research paper that compared various powders within different cartridges, we gain insights into the stored chemical potential energy within gunpowder, which is the total energy within a single cartridge. The authors of the paper reported that the most energy-dense powder yielded approximately 10,647 plus or minus 13 joules per gram, while the lowest recorded value was around 3,878.3 plus or minus 176 joules per gram. As a point of reference, the widely accepted standard is approximately 3,000 joules per gram. These figures will serve as key reference points as we proceed with our measurements. To find the quantity of energy released to heat up the gun barrel, we'll use the law of energy conservation, which is why we needed the values mentioned earlier. When the gunpowder ignites, the energy is transformed into two different forms, kinetic energy as the bullet exits the barrel and heat energy transferred to the gun barrel. For now, we'll assume an ideal energy transfer. This means that all the energy generated is solely devoted to heating the gun barrel, while the remainder contributes to propelling the bullet. Let's begin by calculating the kinetic energy of the bullet upon leaving the barrel, which will help us estimate the heat generated on the jetpack. To determine the bullet speed accurately, let's apply Newton's third law, which states that every force has an equal and opposite counterpart. In this case, the force propelling Barry upward is also responsible for expelling the bullet from the chamber. By balancing these forces with Barry's upward force against gravity's downward pull, we can derive the necessary equations. Barry's height is approximately 5 feet 8 inches, which is about 1.73 meters and he weighs around 165 pounds, or about 74.84 kilograms. 
Assuming Barry's jetpack is constructed from solid steel with a density of about 7.85 grams per cubic centimeter, let's estimate its volume. Since it resembles a minigun with two barrels, we can calculate the volume of one barrel and double it. Considering the jetpack's height is about two-thirds of Barry's height with a distribution of roughly three-fifths for this contraption part and two and a half for the barrel, we can determine the dimensions. After we do some math to find the exact heights by multiplying the ratios, we get that the height of the barrels is about 0.4612 meters and the height of the contraption part is about 0.6918 meters. Now, if we draw some little lines and then do some more multiplication, upon analyzing these dimensions and applying mathematical calculations, we find that the barrels have a diameter of approximately 0.14335 meters, while the contraption has a diameter of around 0.43665 meters with a gap of about 0.071675 meters between the barrel and the contraption's end. Now we can find the volume of the jetpack. For each barrel that protrudes, we'll assume it goes up to this part where the bolts get fed into the chamber. So that's another 0.2306 meters added onto the length of a single barrel. Each barrel's volume, considering its hollow nature, can be determined using the cylinder formula minus the cartridge's width. Once we put the numbers in, we see a value of about 0.005362 meters cubed for a single barrel with a thickness of 0.025 meters, which, when we multiply by 8 for the 8 barrels, jumps to about 0.04289 meters cubed for all the barrels. For the contraption part, which comprises two sides with a height of approximately 0.4612 meters, a diameter of 0.4335, and a thickness of 0.071675 meters, when we multiply out doing the same thing we did last time, we get a volume of about 0.037902 meters cubed for a single contraption and 0.076 cubic meters for the two contraptions. Moving on to the cap of the contraption with a diameter and thickness mirroring the contraption and a height of around 0.2306 meters, it forms an ellipsoid instead. Utilizing the ellipsoid formula, subtracting the volume of another ellipsoid with similar dimensions, gives us a volume of about 0.016 meters cubed, which when we know the drill, we multiply by two, gives us 0.032 cubic meters. When summing up all the volumes, we arrive at a total of approximately 0.1504 cubic meters. Given the density of steel, which is around 7,850 kilograms per meter cubed, multiplying this density by the volume yields a total mass for Barry's jetpack of roughly 1,180.828 kilograms. This substantial weight is borne by Barry as he defies the pull of gravity. Adding Barry's own weight of about 74.4 kilograms, we arrive at a combined mass of approximately 1,255.228 kilograms. It's worth noting that the bullets on Barry's back are an infinite supply, so we'll assume they have no mass due to Barry's magical nature. This prevents us from going into the complexities of infinite forces and infinite power, which would only lead to infinite confusion and an infinite headache for me, given the contradictions and absurdities of such an assumption. So don't forget why we did all this to calculate the mass. It helps us to revisit the force equation, which can help us find the velocity of the bullets and then the heat generated by the jetpack's movement. The equation we've set up links the net force along with Barry's gravitational pull downward and the propulsion lifting him up. Our goal is to determine the acceleration for this net force, which will in turn allow us to calculate the other elements of the equation. In a specific clip, Barry goes from a standstill to ascending rapidly to the rooftop. Measuring his entire vertical displacement using his height as a reference stick, we find he travels about 6.02 meters in approximately 0.4 seconds. Using kinematic equations to solve for the acceleration, we can find that Barry's vertical acceleration is about 75.25 meters per second squared. Given that Barry is slightly slanted, we can measure for an angle of around 45.9 degrees. We can set up an equation for the net force and plugging in the numbers and solving yields a net acceleration of about 85.85 meters per second squared. All of this leads us back to our initial question, finding the heat sustained by the jetpack. The average force for each bullet as it exits the chamber is a combination of Barry's and the jetpack's weight multiplied by the minigun's acceleration. This calculation, which is around 1,255.228 kilograms times 119.68 meters per second squared, results in a force of about 150,225.69 newtons, originating from Barry's jetpack. Utilizing this force, we can determine the bullet's velocity. Initially, we need to get the bullet's mass since the barrel's diameter is 0.10335 meters and a cartridge has a thickness of about 2 millimeters and a length of about 0.3437 meters when we measure as the bullet falls out, we can find the projectile's mass since it's made of steel. To determine the bullet's weight, we'll start by calculating its dimensions. The bullet's radius will be half of the barrel's diameter minus its thickness, which yields a value of approximately 0.10335 divided by 2 minus 0.002 meters, which is this number. Its height will be approximately one third of the 0.3437 meters that we calculated earlier. Assuming the bullet is made of solid steel, we can calculate its volume. 
By multiplying this volume by the density of steel, which is known, we find that the projectile's weight comes out to be around 20.9 kilograms. Having determined the weight of the projectile, we can proceed to find its acceleration. This can be accomplished by dividing the force we calculated earlier by the projectile's mass. This results in an acceleration of approximately 21,547.19 meters per second squared. Now, with the acceleration in hand, we can calculate the velocity of the projectile as it exits the barrel. Given that the length of the barrel is around 0.6918 meters, and utilizing the kinematic equation for for velocity with an initial velocity of zero, we find that the bullet's speed as it leaves the barrel is approximately 172.66 meters per second. With the bullet's velocity known, we can determine its kinetic energy using the appropriate equation, resulting in a kinetic energy of approximately 126,765.44 joules. This energy calculation aligns with our initial purpose, understanding the amount of energy that Barry absorbs. To proceed, now we need to find the chemical potential energy stored within a cartridge. The cartridge has a space of approximately 0.0027 cubic meters. Assuming around 90% of this space is filled with gunpowder, the gunpowder's volume amounts to about 0.0024 cubic meters. Given that the density of gunpowder is roughly 1800 kilograms per cubic meter, multiplying this volume by the density results in an estimated 4.32 kilograms of gunpowder within the cartridge. Each kilogram of this gunpowder possesses a chemical potential energy of about 3 megajoules, resulting in a total of 12.95 megajoules for the entire cartridge. This is the chemical potential energy stored within the gunpowder. Subtracting the kinetic energy from the total energy of the gunpowder, we're left with approximately 12.82 megajoules, which are converted into heat energy upon firing. This heat energy can be used to determine the temperature increase by considering the specific heat capacity acting on the single barrel from which the bullet exits. With steel specific heat capacity being around 510.7896 joules per kilogram times Kelvin, and assuming the initial temperature to be about room temperature, approximately 293 Kelvin, and the single barrel's mass being about 42 kilograms, we can find the resulting temperature increase when we input these values and solve for the final temperature. When we input these values and solve for the final temperature, we find that the barrel's temperature should rise around 890 Kelvin, which is about 1142.33 degrees Fahrenheit after a single gunshot. The temperature increase might appear excessively high, especially when we observe that the tank barrels don't entirely burn or melt upon firing their bullets. So to reconcile this, we have to look at a factor which I didn't talk about earlier, inefficient energy transfer. It's important to acknowledge that not all the 12.8 million joules are absorbed by the individual gun barrel. A notable portion of this energy dissipates into the surrounding environment involving the air, atmosphere, and other factors. Consequently, there's substantial heat loss during the process. To accurately find the heat loss, we'll go back to the clip of the M60 continuously firing until it's unable to do so. From the initial shot to the point where the barrel is glowing red hot, the gun fires for approximately 2 minutes and 18 seconds. By meticulously analyzing the video frame by frame, we can calculate that the average number of projectiles exiting the gun is around 10 per second. Multiplying this rate by the 138 seconds of firing, we determined that approximately 1,380 bullets were discharged. Each bullet in the M60 is a 7.62 times 51 mm round, containing an average of about 52 grains of powder, which is equivalent to roughly 3.37 grams. These bullets have a weight of 9.53 grams. The stored chemical potential energy within the 3.37 grams of gunpowder is about 10,108 joules of energy per bullet. As the round exits the barrel, its kinetic energy is calculated by multiplying its mass with the exit speed of approximately 853 meters per second, resulting in roughly 3,499.65 joules. This implies that the remaining energy, which is around 6,608.35 joules, is converted into thermal energy as each round is fired. With 1,380 rounds discharged, this leads to a total of approximately 8,643,721 joules of heat energy being generated, assuming no effects from the heat on slowing down the bullets. Considering the M60 barrel's weight to be roughly 1 kilogram, we can input relevant values to calculate the overall temperature change of the barrel. This outcome reveals a staggering increase of approximately 17,215 degrees Kelvin, which translates to about 30,527 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature surpassing the interior of the sun's temperature. However, it's evident that the barrel isn't triggering nuclear fusion and causing surrounding materials to melt. So, in reality, the majority of the energy dissipates into the surrounding air and the barrel doesn't efficiently absorb it. Examining the barrel's temperature, we know it resembles the temperature of steel at around 890 degrees Celsius. By recalculating the energy required to reach this temperature, while incorporating the same values as before but accounting for the actual temperature change, we deduce that the barrel absorbs about 444,386 joules of energy. This is a huge difference from perfect energy transfer, which would yield about 8,643,721 joules. So in reality, the barrel only 
absorbs about 5.14% of the heat energy expended, while the rest is absorbed by the surrounding environment. Applying the 5.14% efficiency of energy transfer to each bullet fired by Barry, we find that the temperature increase is around 323.721 degrees Kelvin or approximately 118 degrees Fahrenheit after each shot. This means that the equilibrium temperature inside the barrel when a bullet is fired becomes remarkably high. Considering that the barrel's melting point is a maximum of 2800 degrees Fahrenheit, it's expected that the entire barrel would reach this temperature capable of melting steel and potentially incinerating Barry alive after roughly 24 shots. However, remarkably, Barry remains unfazed by this intense heat and continues unabated. And even disregarding the fact that the jetpack will burn after a while, there are also lasers near the temperature of the sun and missiles Barry gets really close to and he doesn't get fried at all. The investigation into the survival of Barry's steak fries amidst the fiery chaos of the bullet frying jetpack in Jetpack Joyride has unraveled a complex interplay of physics and fantasy. Part one of this exploration has taken us on the journey through the intricacies of energy transfer, heat generation, and the enigmatic nature of Barry's existence. We've dissected the science behind the jetpack's operation, delving into the intricacies of kinetic energy, chemical potential energy, and the inefficiencies of energy transfer. And despite all odds and all the logical constraints of the real world, Barry remains an unburned, undaunted hero. As we wait for part two of this investigation, it's clear that there will be pieces of the puzzle yet to be unveiled. What more can we discover about the enigmas of Barry's survival? What new insights will be gained as we continue to explore the boundary between imagination and scientific rigor? The adventure is far from over, and we can look forward to further unraveling the extraordinary tale of Barry's take fries and his seemingly invincible jetpack.